Welcome back everybody, this is Lars and uh, let's talk, shall we? So uh, today I want to talk about um, a topic that I've been uh, thinking a lot about over the years, really. So we, we live in a society where technological process is, uh, or progress is very, very quick. It, it is horribly, horribly quick, really, when you think about it. Look, uh, I have one of these things and... Uh, um, ten years ago, yeah, that wouldn't be possible at all, right? And that, that is like high-tech stuff, but there's so much other stuff as well that just it wouldn't be possible ten years ago, especially in robotics. And uh, when it comes to robotics, you either think about it as like a fully functional, like humanoid-ish android, or you think about it as you know, uh, machinery, right? Just some stupid machine that does something automatically. An automaton, really. Which is probably a better definition, defined as a humanoid android thing. But whatever. You you get my point. The thing is, it's, it's actually it's a bit more subtle than that. Because robotics and the... Um, impact it has on our society is um, is actually usually um, not given enough thought because we are in a society now where a larger and larger uh, segment of the population is driven away from work basically because it's it's not available a lot of the, the jobs that especially unskilled labor could uh, be used for even like 15 20 years ago is now more <laughs> it's more economically um, economically sensible for the owners of the, uh, the factory or the production facility to employ robots if you if you have a look at um, if you haven't watched uh, CPG grace uh, CGP CGP grace um, excellent video on uh, this uh, this stuff you really should look it up it is um i think i think it's called humans need not apply you should really check it out as it's uh it gives kind of a good rundown on the techno uh, technological part of it and uh, basically it states that the way that horses <laughs> were used in the late 1800s and then were basically just phased out uh in the early 1900s it's more or less the same process we are going through right now because in the beginning you started automating a lot of the grunt work just where you needed power but not flexibility and then you started uh outsour or uh, you know automating this stuff where you actually transported people and you needed to actually be able to change the process uh whenever and wherever and then in the end you know horses right now they are closer to pets than working animals really uh, which but they had been working animals for a long long time since the plow I guess and probably before that as well uh, I'm not that into horse history so you'll have to forgive me if I say if I'm saying something stupid but the thing is in a world where more and more people um, are not employable basically because a, a machine can do the job better and if you don't think that could happen to highly skilled people uh, how many people working as a calculator have you seen in the last 10-15 years because they used to be really really uh, common that we had a human before computers you had a human calculator basically people who sat there doing math that was their job hasn't been done since the 60s maybe in the 50s but that that was a thing and now like i have more computing power in my phone than the whole space uh, uh the, the whole during the whole space race you know during the moon landing and stuff like that so the scale of the thing is just it, it is insane of course it is absolutely really insane uh, and the point where this gets really interesting is that at this point, yes, we have been automating some of the more predictable stuff. Like, if you 
can make a machine that uh, replaces the guy who says that, all right, one plus one, yeah, that's two. Because that's just a logical process. That's not hard to automate. And uh, automating the guy that puts something on one, uh, one um, conveyor belt and then another machine that picks it back up and puts it somewhere else, maybe it punches a hole in it, that, that's fine. That's something e easily done, but that, that is static. It is a static function, basically. Um, if you're a pro programmer, you'll laugh because I, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> but uh, what you, what you'll end up with right now is basically it's going to be a point in time where it's easier to apply robotics to the flexible jobs as well, where you need to learn and adapt to be able to do the job. And uh, the first robots that can do that, that you can train to do a certain job that aren't made for that job, are actually here. They are still pretty simple, but give it 10, 15, maybe 20 years, and uh, you won't see people doing, like, cashier work and all that stuff. It's better to have something that looks remotely human and actually greets you, and if you ask it a question, it will answer, and then it's going to just check the system. It doesn't even need to punch anything into it. So it'll give an instant response. It can work 24 hours a day, as long as it's hooked up to something. And when when the store closes, you can go, just tell it and to go and restock the shelves. And it will figure it out itself, because it is actually smart enough to do that. It doesn't have like a proper intelligence, but it is able to uh, like uh, not I wouldn't call it understand but it's able to uh, uh, logically deduce how to do certain tasks like it, it knows what a warehouse is it knows what the back room is it knows the definitions of those th things and it's able to uh, decode simple imagery and make you know the logical leap that well oh that's that's the room where I'm supposed to go and these are the shelves because I recognize them as shelves as the concept shelves not just the uh, object shelves and so I should where there is cheese and there's not like a full thing of cheese I should put more cheese there so it will look into the shelves and then go get more cheese and fill it up and a robot that could do that just basically says, that, well, we don't need people to work in those uh, places anymore. And if all the guy, all the um, workers are robotic, do you need the guy who really tells them that, well, do you have to get to work? Just, you know, kind of, he's there to manage the people. But what if I'm, they just worked on a schedule, really? They, you know, you don't have to tell the robot that you should. When the, the store is closed, you have to go do that. You can just tell them, well, every day <laughs> when that happens, you just go and do that thing. And these are your routines. Do them at all times. So you don't need a manager, right? So what about, well, somebody needs to fill, fill up the uh, warehouse or the uh, storage room with, you know, goods, right? Well, the truck doesn't really need to be driven by a human. It's more efficient to just have him drive 24-7. So I guess a machine can do that. A robotic lift can, you know, lift all the uh, stuff out of the uh, truck and into the storage room. So we don't need that. Like a fork, forklift, if we're able to drive in traffic, like a robot can drive in traffic, it, it can operate a forklift. Uh, there's no no problem at all okay so then the whole shop is taken care of well, what about the central storage room well you, you you already have like Amazon has several places where everything is automatic the whole thing is automatic so basically the order takes in a robot <laughs> scoots over to a shelf picks it up, puts it in a packing machine, and out it goes. That's it. No people involved. 
And of course, the robot actually restocks the stuff from uh, when the producer delivers more stuff. And with the proper automation, you could also order more stuff. So, oh, <laughs> we are down to less than 20% stock on some uh, merchandise. Well, better order more. <laughs> order a full set and we'll just stuck, uh, you know, st stick it in there. So we don't need people for that. Um, same for food, I guess, to your local store or whatever kind of store it is, really. It's, uh, it could be a bookstore. It could be whatever. If we even have bookstores at that point, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so, and then we have production. And I guess if you can teach a robot to operate a store, why couldn't you teach a robot to milk a cow or, you know, start a cheese making machine or whatever is going to happen, you know? And fill the truck, make the truck go to the central storage, make the central storage bots fill another truck, make it go to the store, and that's it. So, of course, but yeah, this is still low skilled labor, more or less. So maybe that's not a problem. Maybe we'll all have better jobs, you know? Nobody has to do that boring stuff. Everybody will get great jobs. Well, guess again. Um, so right now we have a lot of, like, people who are accountants and stuff like that who basically their job is enforcing certain business rules. If you look look at it, you know, uh, the essence of it, they say that, oh, well, if that kind of sale happened, it should go into that part of the accounting system, make sure that happened, make sure that all the stuff worked. The systems can do a lot themselves right now. So, like, if there's a new type of merchandise, it should be categorized as a new type of merchandise. So somebody needs to set up a new category. Well, honestly, the system can do that itself. You just give it enough information and enough processing powers. And uh, we're, we're getting there as well. So you don't need those people. Um, of course, you, you of course need some people to plan what to produce at some point or you need some people to you know just to ban what kind of factory do we need to build to expand or where should we open a shop well not really because if you're able to quantify what kind of uh, details if you need to know certain production numbers and stuff like that if that's your uh, data set, then you can make a machine work out the details and make the call as well. And of course you can have construction robots that are stronger and basically much more thorough than any human would be and work for pennies and dollar basically. Uh, so who do you need then to work? You could probably make a robot that would cut your hair with a precision that no mm, human could do. Of course, you know, there will always be a place for... You know, there are a lot of places where the human interaction part of it will be desired. Maybe in the um, grocery store, like, one out of three uh, employees will actually stay stay on and sit in the um in the and just man this checkout line because people like to see people uh but all the other stuff can be done so at some point when the machines are able to anticipate the needs of the other machines or the need for the other machines to actually operate so if a machine can see that, well, these other machines have to do this task to make sure that these levels of consumption of some sort of resource can be upheld. So you need, let's say cheese. <laughs> cheese is getting more popular. We need one more factory to make cheese. Well, yeah, sure. We could look at numbers. And what do humans see? Well, we look at the graph. We look far enough back that we see that it's not just a um, seasonal thing sure this is an increase that happens every year and in 2000 and something we need that factory to meet demands we should probably start building it in one year sure put down the order make every preparation but a machine can do that a machine right now is probably uh, making more money on the stock market than most people would be able to do because it can process all that stuff faster, it can take more data into consideration and do a better job. 
So if we don't, don't need physical people for physical labor and we don't need them for data processing, and we don't need them for most mid-level decision making, where do people fit into all this? And uh, how do we deal with a society that actually doesn't need people to work? Because our society is based on people working, getting paid, spending money. That money is then processed through the system and put back into the hands of other people who work, get paid and spend money. So, yeah. How? 